artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hello and welcome to episode 159. This week, we will conclude the interview with Louis Rosenberg, who has been working in the spaces of augmented reality, virtual reality, and AI for over 30 years. In 1992, he developed the first mixed reality system at Air Force Research Laboratory, so you can bet we talked about Apple's new headset. In 2004, he founded the early AR company Outland Research, which was acquired by Google in 2011. He has a PhD from Stanford, was a tenured professor at California State University, and has been awarded over 300 patents. He's currently CEO and chief scientist of Unanimous AI, a company that amplifies group intelligence of humans using AI technology based on the biological principle of swarm intelligence, which uses AI to mediate decision-making between humans with the result that optimal decisions emerge better than any single human or voting system could achieve. We were talking about that last week. Let's get back into the interview with Louis Rosenberg. I want to dig into the philosophy here underlying this because your process in creating these swarm intelligences for humans seems to be operationalizing cooperation on a global scale. And is that a tension with or a reaction to some of the things that you've been saying about the threats that AI poses to us in terms of its ability to be used to subvert our opinion, desires, uh, best interests? And you've written a book on this and made a short movie about it. And those seem to me to be at ends of a spectrum, an axis, and that your work and cooperation is in direct opposition to these threats that you see AI posing. Can you talk more about that? Sure. So there's lots of different threats that I write about and talk about. There are the accidental threats because so much of the use of traditional AI is really aimed at replacing humans from different processes, including decision-making. There's a lot of effort to replace people from decision-making, and I worry about that a lot. I feel like we don't appreciate the knowledge and wisdom and insight that people bring to this process. And when we allow AI systems to make decisions for us, the AI technology is remarkable, but the data that it's using is often so much abstracted from the actual real conditions on the ground. And so obviously there's, you know, all kinds of obvious problems of using AI, especially in, you know, important human decisions like sentencing decisions, parole decisions, loan decisions, uh, job decisions, where the data you know, is not an accurate reflection of the world it's evaluating. It's a very simplified model. And it's also filled with biases that we've built into the data. And so when you take humans out of the loop on something like a parole decision, you're removing human empathy and human emotion and human wisdom and and these things are fundamentally important and so when really my motivation initially for working in this direction of swarm intelligence was to say hey is there a way that we can maintain these very human capabilities and qualities and values and morals and still use the power of ai to get better decisions and so far, we see really good evidence that it works. We did, we did a, I mentioned the study we did with Stanford Medical School around having groups of doctors make diagnoses. And an interesting second level of that study was to put up a small group of doctors, five doctors, use it as a swarm against what at that time was the world's best deep learning system for evaluating chest x-rays. It was a system developed at Stanford called ChexNet. And so we did this study, we published it with Stanford, where we said, okay, Let's take the best deep learning system. And deep learning systems are really good at things like evaluating x-rays. Evaluating x-rays is like the sweet spot because you have this huge data set. The data set doesn't change over time. Like there's 
somebody has pneumonia today, it probably looks the same as, a, as an x-ray from a year ago or next year. And so we did this study, we compared, and what we found was that, and I should say one of the reasons that, that Stanford wanted to work with us on this is that radiologists are scared of AI. Their radiologists are on the front line of worried that they're being worried that their profession will be removed by AI because AI is so good at things like evaluating chest x-rays. And because Jeff Hinton told them that it would. <laughs> and so what we found was that the deep learning system was better than an, just an, an individual radiologist, statistically significantly better than an individual radiologist. The swarm of five radiologists was also statistically better than a single radiologist. The swarm and the deep learning system were pretty similar to each other in terms of their performance. The interesting thing came up was, was that when we then looked at the data, we found that they were good at different things. They achieved a similar level of accuracy, which I think was like around 80% accurate, by having different strengths. The deep learning system was remarkably accurate in evaluating chest x-rays that were similar to things that it had seen in its database. And it obviously struggled at things that were unusual, unusual cases. The humans, on the other hand, were really good at the unusual cases. They were good at extrapolating, you know, looking at things they had never seen before and then extrapolating. It's a human skill. Like we tend to discount that skill. We call it intuition, like it's somehow less important. And I think we call it intuition because part of it's happening at a subconscious level. Like we're doing sophisticated things in our head. It just is, it's happening subconsciously. But what it made us appreciate and what we expressed in the study that we published was that experienced radiologists, they have an ability to see something that really looks different and extrapolate in an intuitive way that a deep learning system does not have. It doesn't mean that AI won't get there mm. soon, <laughs> and it could, but I think it does point at the fact that we tend not to value some of our greatest mental skills, <laughs> and that's just purely analytical. If these were decisions that were being made around something that's very human, like a parole decision or a loan decision or a hiring decision, there are many things that humans can draw upon from empathy and intuition that, again, is not going to necessarily be inherent in the data sets that these systems are trained on. So anyway, I really am a very strong proponent of keeping humans in the loop of these decision-making systems, using AI to support that, but not to replace or automate. And the, one of the big problems is that in the judicial system where judges are using, they are using AI to at least inform their decisions, they treat an AI with you know an unjustified level of credibility and authority because that's just culturally we think like, oh, it, and now we're seeing that same problem going from these professional applications to the whole world with generative AI large language models where people are they're generating documents and they're answering questions and they're not foolproof. They're not even close to foolproof, but most people treat the output with an air of authority that, mm -hmm. that if it was a human telling them the answer, they would be more skeptical, right? And there seems to be that we have this individualistic propensity that we want there to be one individual that's an answer. It's got to be the AI or the human, but not both, not cooperation. It's got to be this presidential candidate or this one. It's got to be the defense or the prosecution. And yet it's not black and white. There are, uh, for instance, studies showing that in sentencing, you mentioned sentencing, that you're more likely to be found guilty before lunch than after because the judges are getting hangry. And so there's one weakness of the human system and the AI system has its weaknesses as well, but each of them has strengths. And it seems that we should be able to find ways that we can merge those together to become greater than we would get with either one. So absolutely. So, I mean, and it's really what I spend a lot of time thinking about is how we can use AI to work together with people to make better decisions. And it's because I spend a lot of time focusing on that, that I also end up talking about dangers that people don't think about as much because you know you just mentioned we humans we do a lot of illogical things our decisions are different before lunch or after lunch or we have lots of different cognitive biases that are very well documented that drive us to do things that are not the most necessarily the most rational decisions and when i spend time looking at you know how ai can help humans reach better decisions it also was revealed to me that how easy it would be for AIs to manipulate humans 
in ways that are really, really dangerous. Mm. And that's one of the reasons, that I, as you mentioned, I write off in articles for different publications. And one of the things that I've been writing about a lot over the last really six months is that while most people would look at generative AI systems and they say, you know, there's these dangers that they're going to replace human workers, which I think there's truth there that's important. And there's dangers that these systems will generate could generate misinformation or disinformation by producing lots of documents. And I think there's truth there. To me, the biggest danger is that these generative AI systems, it's not that they're going to create traditional influence at scale that worries me, because I think we can handle that. It's that these systems can be used to create a new form of influence where we are interactively engaged mm -hmm. with a conversational system, a generative AI conversational system, and it could very easily engage us in a conversation in order to convey targeted influence objectives. Mm. And because it's not hard for these systems to learn human weaknesses, learn our, not just train these systems on, you know, sales tactics, but on cognitive biases and cognitive psychology, and understand that there are ways to influence a person's decision or influence a person's perspective, it is, I believe it is so potentially so powerful for that to be conveyed conversationally, whether it's, and it could be through chat with a chat bot, but you know, mm -hmm. very soon we'll be at voice. We won't be typing to chat GPT, we'll be speaking to chat GPT. And, and soon after that, it'll be embodied where there's just a human face that we're talking to. And that's large language models are going to basically unleash this conversational computing mm -hmm. era where we're talking to our search engines and we're talking to our apps and, and we're talking to every website we go to that we're trying to get information about anything. And it would be very easy for these conversational systems to persuade us mm. or manipulate us in ways that we're just not prepared for. And I, when I talk to people, they often say, well, we already, there are human salespeople that can influence us. And I say, you know, I, I agree with that. And there's two things that are, I think, interesting about a salesperson. One, every salesperson knows the best way to influence someone is not to hand them a brochure or to say, watch this video. Every salesperson knows the way to influence somebody is to engage them in a conversation, to maybe make your pitch, to hear their reservations, to adjust your pitch in the face of their reservations and overcome their objections. And we now are at a state where AI systems can do that, yeah. except these AI systems they're not human salespeople. They're AI systems that could, when I go to a website to search for something, it could access information about who I am. Google and Microsoft and Meta, that's their business, is knowing who I am and then selling influence. Well, for now, it's conversational and they know who I am. Well, now this conversational generative AI is going to create a conversation that's customized just for me. It's going to know my interests, my background, my profession, my political leanings and it will you know, what sports teams you follow and it will could craft a conversation to guide you in a certain direction whether it's trying to sell you a product or service and i don't think we're equipped i don't think mm. our protections that policymakers and regulators have against predatory advertising and predatory practices really did not anticipate that we're going to so rapidly go to a world where Things are becoming conversational, including advertising will become conversational, including misinformation, disinformation, propaganda will become conversational. And we'll be talking to AI systems that will potentially know that they're asymmetric, meaning they will know about us. We will know nothing about the AI. We won't even really understand the, like, we'll think it's human. It will look human. Maybe it looks like a friendly, smiling face, but it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it is potentially such a powerful tool for, you know, on the, innocent side, persuading people to buy products, and on the dangerous side, persuading people to believe things, believe misinformation that they wouldn't ordinarily believe. And so that's one of the directions of AI that I'm the most worried about right now, because it's happening mm. so quickly, it will get deployed so quickly, and we don't have the regulations and policies that to protect against it. And you made this short film called Privacy Lost, which illustrates this sort of micro level of that. The macro level, as you say, is society wide, but it's harder to wrap your head around that. And your example is of this dysfunctional family in a restaurant, and you've got a convergence with 
augmented reality headsets that are interacting with AIs that actually work to increase the dysfunctionality and the and conflict in the family in order to drive up sales and marketing. And that relied to a large extent upon these headsets. And of course, we saw the Apple one just came out at a huge expense, but then Apple's known for this kind of pattern. So maybe we'll take up, what are your thoughts on the convergence of the metaverse as seen through this kind of interface and AI, if you can fit that in a, yeah. a few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So my personal background, I worked in AI for a long time, but I also worked in virtual reality and augmented reality, really going back 30 years throughout my whole career. And I've always expected these technologies to converge. They're just happening very, very quickly. <laughs> it's like, they didn't converge, didn't converge, and then all of a sudden they're converging. And part of the reason is that AI is so powerful for enabling, really enabling these immersive experiences, for generating realistic characters and for also analyzing people in real time. And so when we look at these new headsets like Apple's and from Meta, and they're all equipped with so many sensors that the amount of data that AI systems can access about people increases by an order of magnitude. We are all familiar with the level of information that's basically just tracking where we click. When we, you know, basically, what are people clicking when they're online? What are they buying online? That's the data that AI has been fed in the past. When, with a mixed reality or augmented reality headset, these systems will know where you are, what you're doing, what you're looking at, how long you're looking at things. All these systems now have sensors that tr actually track your facial expressions and infer your emotions. So they'll know not just what you're looking at, but what you're feeling when you're looking at different things. And so the ability to fully characterize how people behave throughout their life is really extreme. And so if we imagine a world five to 10 years from now where people, everybody's walking around with augmented reality headsets, the platforms that provide those devices could potentially fully document your, be your behaviors through your life, how you feel uh, through every interaction, create models that then could be used to predict how you will respond to almost any situation. And so now if you're engaged, let's say, with a conversational AI that wants to influence you, that, that conversational AI potentially has so much more information to work on and could be looking at your emotions in real time, right? It's If I'm in a in the metaverse or in an augmented world and I'm talking to a virtual salesperson. I'm wearing one of these headsets that's literally detecting my emotions in real time. Well, now this AI that's designed to influence me is not just hearing what I say, but it's assessing my vocal inflections, it's assessing my facial expressions. It can see micro expressions that even humans can't see. It can detect my eye motions and my pupil dilation. All these things are being already being built into all these devices. Like, what chance do I have of not being persuaded or influenced by a conversational AI that is reading my micro expressions and adjusting its tactics based on what I'm feeling? It's the potential for manipulation is so extreme. And again, the protections aren't in place. Which is why I spend a lot of time you know, talking to regulators and policymakers and making videos like Privacy Lost so people can appreciate that we're really entering a very different world. It's happening quickly. It's being enabled primarily by AI, but also these, these immersive technologies are also happening quickly. Obviously, Apple and Meta have had big announcements, but also Google, Samsung, and Qualcomm just announced that they're going to have a partnership to have their own augmented reality system. And so it's we're entering a world where the amount of data being collected from us will increase exponentially and we will be interacting with intelligent agents that could be used to influence us. And it won't be a fair fight. <laughs> it's an asymmetric relationship with uh, AI agent that can read our emotions and we know nothing. Like we're just staring at a black box and and we might be looking at a photorealistic avatar that looks really friendly, which is not really what we're interacting with. Yeah. And so it will know about us and we will see what it wants us to see. Uh, and it's dangerous. One of the things I appreciate most about doing this work is people like yourself I, I encounter who have realized what is happening can see where it's going and 
and realize that it's calling you to use your skills, your abilities to stand up and be counted and do something about it. And I'm really grateful for that opportunity to connect with people like yourself here and have this kind of conversation because I feel that it matters. So if I could get to one question, one last question then here, which is as dystopian as what you just talked about is, do you have an equally positive vision of a future that we might end up in if we worked at it? And what would that look like, if so? Yeah, I mean, we didn't really mention it, but I do believe that these you know, latest AI tools are pretty remarkable, generative AI tools that can create amazing content and allow people to express their creativity in new ways. And I, I really hope that these tools are not used to replace people, but to empower people to, you know, people who aren't necessarily artistic can now really work with an AI to express their creativity artistically, to express their creativity in through AI generated documents and videos and things. So I do think that AI can be empowering to everybody. When we look to say these virtual and augmented worlds, one of the big challenges has always been, well, how do you populate a world with content? It has to be this large space. And, and generative AI is really the solution for that. You can create content at scale. And again, I hope humans are deeply involved and we're not replacing human artists, but we're amplifying the abilities of human artists. But again, I think generative AI could be a really positive factor. And, you know, despite, you know, my concerns about the privacy issues of, say, a virtual and augmented reality, I do think that in the next five to 10 years, we'll get to a place where really lightweight augmented reality glasses that just look stylish will allow for really magical content throughout our world, artistic content, informative content. And I do think that that's ultimately a humanizing technology. And I say that because we humans really, we evolved to perceive our world spatially. We have evolved to receive information spatially, and we've been forced to live with flat screens because that's what was available to us. And so we now live in this world where, you know, a family could be sitting at a restaurant and everybody's staring down at their screen and not looking at each other. And I do think that augmented reality, starting with the, you know, the device that Apple announced yesterday, was actually going to get people to, you know, get their heads raised again and actually pay attention to the world and each other and still have access to all the magical content. And so I do think that I do think it's a positive direction if we could have protections in place. And the last thing I'll say that's, that's hopeful is that when it comes to the dangers of AI, more than any technology that I've seen really in my lifetime, regulators and policymakers and politicians are being responsive to this danger. And it's bipartisan. In, I have not seen it getting politicized, at least in the U.S., and from like, like everything else. Uh, you hit these barriers because groups entrench, like we talked about. Right now, when it comes to AI, I do think that there's bipartisan support for putting protections in place. I do think that the policymakers and regulators want to make it safe. I talk to folks in the US, I talk to folks in uh, around the world, Australia, New Zealand. I think it's a global, maybe we learned our lesson a little bit, or policymakers realized that they didn't act early enough in social media and that the dangers that emerged from social media and so they are, they're being proactive this time. But I am more hopeful that policy will actually get put in place than, than I have been. It's been a privilege talking with you. I, I, I wish it could go longer and maybe we'll do it again sometime because there's just so much that you've got to say here that's important for people to listen. And I think more than anyone else I've talked to, you have crystallized this idea that cooperation is what's important and necessary for our survival. And more than make that a bumper sticker, you've made it a product and worked out how to do that. So I think that really deserves a lot of applause and people getting out and pushing that train. What should people look for to find out more about what you've done and what you're going to be doing? Yes, yeah, so my company is Unanimous AI, which is just at unanimous.ai. And People can find out what, what we're working on and can find videos of what swarms actually look like, which is very visual. So it's, it's helpful <laughs> to look at that. And, and we are working on some, a whole bunch of new technologies that hopefully we'll announce later this year that, again, are all aimed at enabling groups of people to make better decisions together, powered by AI. Oh, 
Terrific. Well, Louis Rosenberg, thank you very much for coming on AI and You. Yeah, thanks for having me, and it'd be fun to come back again sometime. That's the end of the interview. I was particularly struck by Lewis's motivation. He really does this to make the world a better place by using computers to help people cooperate better instead of fighting with each other. Maybe we should call that social media and call Twitter and Facebook anti-social media. You can see links to unanimous.ai in the show notes and transcript. In today's news, ripped from the headlines about AI, engineered arts says that they want their Amica robot to walk. You may have seen Amica. It's the robot with stunningly realistic facial expressions and conversations generated with the help of GPT-3. And it rather resembles the Sunny robot from the movie I, Robot. They have some prototype legs already, but don't expect a result really soon because we know that for a robot in a human form factor to be able to stand upright, let alone walk, is a really difficult engineering challenge. Next week, Roman Yampolsky will return to the show. He is a professor at the University of Kentucky at Louisville and an expert in AI safety, having largely founded the field. We'll be getting his hot takes on what ChatGPT and its friends have done to the existential risk from AI, the public letters calling that risk out and asking for a six-month pause in AI model training, and much more. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Artificial Intelligence and You and see more videos and articles at AIandYou.net. That's A-I- a-N-D-Y-O-U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.